my message started from some of the Bible verses I sent y'all this week. And then I, as I started preparing and studying, I ended up not even using the verse I started with. So bear with me as I, I try to um, talk about our Christian walk. Some time ago I preached a series of being Christ-like. We have, every, we have opportunities every day. Do we take advantage of them? Do we really take advantages of the times that God put somebody... I, I failed last week. Somebody, God was telling me to say something and I was too busy. I got too busy. And I just kept going. And I got convicted of it later that, you know, I didn't do what I was supposed to do. Now, I'm telling you that because all of us get too busy. All of us forget. All of us are so consumed with life that we don't always do what we're supposed to do. First slide, Dion. I did this this time, and, and I told Debbie last night, I did both services on just a couple of slides, and then when I start writing my notes down, it's too bunched up. So I'm going to fix it next week, but I didn't really pay that close attention. Now as never before, we are called to be Christians, Christ-like. Are we truly sincere in our walk? Did we come today to get our weekly fix? Now, I know this group don't come to get their weekly fix. Y'all are faithful, and we're family. And I appreciate it so much, and I love you, and, and it encourages me. What discourages me is it's not more. But, uh, you know, I know that, that y'all are here because you love God and you love this church. And, and I really appreciate it, and, and I, I, I thank you for your faithfulness. But there's a lot of things going on, and... and and it's easy to get sidetracked. I tell people all the time, conversation with um, some members recently, well, uh, one that's been here for three weeks in a row, I told her that, you know, you miss that first time and it's easy to miss the second, but by the time you miss that third, you're going to just keep missing and keep missing and keep... And something's going to have to happen to bring you back. You know, we shouldn't be that way. We know God's promises. We know everything we're supposed to do. But we let our human nature take over. With all the turmoil in the church and in the world, we need godly examples. Every day I hear about failures. Every single day. This morning. Preacher resigned, a church is closed, got a for sale sign on it. And another one's having a lot of turmoil. We hear this every single day. I'm thankful here that when turmoil sticks his nose up, the turmoil usually leaves. You know, we don't have people here trying to tear things apart and 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 really destroy the work of God. Well, don't say it too loud because the devil will hear you work it. And, and, and it's true, you know, the church that I grew up in, okay, and, and I even wrote this, and I didn't write that in my notes, but 50 years ago, my pastor preached a message, where do we turn to first? What do we turn to first when something goes wrong? What is our first thought process when something goes wrong. If our first thought process is God related and we turn to God, we eliminate turmoil. But if we try to fix it on our own, if we try to do everything on our own, it causes turmoil in our life. Where do we turn to first? I'm afraid or being honest, but many of us Turn to our bank account or our abilities. 
we, we turn to what we're comfortable with. Or we turn to our government and our armies. Think about it. With all the turmoil going on in the world, it's money or government. And those two things fix everything. It's time for us to step up and put God first. Put Him first. You know, that's what we need to do. Just like a while ago I said that I slipped this week when I didn't talk to somebody that God had laid something on my heart. I didn't do it intentionally, but I got caught up in the hustle and bustle of life. So consequently, by doing that, I didn't put God first. I mean, that's really what it boils down to, is I didn't put Him first. <clears throat> the passages that I'm reading, I think was, I started uh, Philippians 2 and, and verse 3, and I preached this message from verse 3 probably three years ago, but it's, it's totally different this time because every time you work open the Bible, you get something else out of it. But it says, Do nothing from selfish or empty conceit, but with humility of mind, regard one another as more important than yourselves. Do not merely look out for your own personal interests, but also the interest of others. Have, the, have this attitude in yourself, which is also in Christ Jesus, who although he existed in the form of God, did not regard himself e equality with God, uh, a thing... I can't even see him with my glasses on. A thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking a form of a bondservant, and being made in the likeness of man. Emptied himself. We're supposed to empty ourselves. What does it mean when it says empty itself? It means that you become a bond servant. It means that you become a servant of God. But yet, we let self get in the way. And that's what that verse is talking about, is don't let self get in the way. The thing that's interesting to it is, to me is, is this were the words, this is talking about God's Son. And we have trouble. We have trouble in it all the time. The next part of that says being found in appearance as a man. That's how we know it was about Jesus Christ. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of even death on the cross. How far will we go for God? What happens if our country turns its back, really, on the church? How far will we take it? Will we stand true? Will we keep on practicing what we believe? We did that study on the secret church. Will we go secretly and worship? Or will we stop? I think this group would keep on. But what about the 30 or 40 people, the 20 or 30 people that will be here the next service? Where will they be? For this is the reason also God highly exalted him and bestowed him the name which is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee will bow, and those in heaven and earth and that every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. It's going to happen. One day, what the scripture says, every knee will bow, every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. The thing is, about all this is, is... We're literally Christ, prized possession. He did it for me. He did it for you. 
He went to the cross because He loved us. If He would die on the cross for me, can I not put God first in my life? Lied Dion. The next part of this is this is actually where my, my sermon began when I first started, but I thought I needed to give some background. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Work out. Continue to work until completion. Death. But it's not talking about works. It's not talking about doing works. Being justified as a gift by the grace through His redemption, which is in Christ Jesus... That's Romans 3.24. And then one we quote all the time, Ephesians uh, 2, 8, 9. For by grace are you, you have been saved through faith. It's a gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. So what does it mean to, to, to work out? It means to live a life that exemplifies God and work until death. Just continue to live a Christ, a life that pleases God. Not work for salvation. Deb's sitting there questioning, I think. It's a pursuit of obedience. Working out's a pursuit of obedience. It's obeying God. It's doing what He tells us to do. Um, the a couple of verses over in, in this chapter, or the next chapter... It talks about preaching forward to what lies ahead. That's working. You talk about what is to come. Fear and trembling. It's a healthy fear of God and respect. Proverbs 1.7 says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Fools despise wisdom and instruction. Verse 13 of this passage, and, and I, I'm, I'm sorry, in verse 13 of chapter 2, God is at work in you for His good pleasure. God works in your life because it's satisfying. Because He loves us. He loves us so much that He sent His Son. And it's for His good pleasure. God works in our Christian walk as we follow Him. As He indwells in us, it is not a life without obstacles. Do we have obstacles? Do we have snares? Do we have things to get in our way? Do we get too busy? It's a life with God walking through those, walking through those obstacles. Walking in those obstacles with us. Acts 1.8 says, You shall be my witnesses for His good pleasure. Doing things without grumbling or disputing. We talked about that just a little while ago. Churches that are grumbling. Churches that are having problems. You know, the Bible tells us that we're supposed to do things without grumbling or disputing. We're supposed to be Christians, Christ-like. Can you imagine Christ grumbling, getting bad attitude with the disciples? Well, guess what? We're not supposed to either. We're supposed to live a life without grumbling. I put here, I'm a positive person, but sometimes things get under my skin. Sometimes I get so mad at myself because of the way I react. Sometimes I, you know, what really gets under my skin right now is the political process. What really gets under my skin right now is, is the, the process that, that our, the way our country has gone, the way that, that we're doing this, that just aggravates the living daylights out of me. It's, it's, you know, when I do it, I'm wrong. But when 
the other half of the world does it, they, they're perfectly right. They're, you know, they, they think they've got a right to, to stand up and protest and burn buildings and, and, and uh, have riots because it's their right. But if I did it, I would be wrong. I get mad about it. I get fired up about crazy stuff. I used the other word, Sam, but I changed it. I really get fired up about it. This is, when you get fired up, it's an emotional rejection of God's providence in your life. If you get fired up and get angry and you you start grumbling and disputing and, and everything, you're literally having an emotional rejection of God's providence in your life. So that you may prove yourselves. I'm going to get through way early. No, I'm not. So that you may prove yourselves. Next part of that verse. Prove yourselves indicates a process. When you become a Christian, you don't know it all. I've been a Christian for 40, no, I'm 60, 54 years, and I don't know it all. Okay? And when you become a Christian, it's not like you flip a switch and you learn it all. It's a process. You have to learn every day. And I can even associate it with the business world. When I was manager, I always told my people that if you're not learning every day, if you're not improving every day, you're actually going backwards. And that's really what it means as a process. Growing towards something is the maturity as a believer. You know, I disagree with the denomination on, on one of their beliefs. I have a good friend, Kevin Thomas, who teaches and preaches a second salvation. We call it sanctification. Sanctification. That, that you, as, as you mature, you become more sanctified. You, you really grow and you learn and you, everything about you becomes God. Okay? Someone that really dedicates their life to Christ, they, they, I look at Wayne Wells. Okay? Now, Wayne does things that I disagree with. Okay? But Wayne, to me, is that, that Christian mentor, that example that is always encouraging somebody. Okay? And, and that's part of the sanctification process. Well, my friend believes in a second salvation. It's, we believe the same thing, except for they add to it a little bit. They believe that, that once you become a Christian and you grow as a Christian, you reach a point that, that you've got to get saved again as a second salvation. And it's that at that point, you become where you don't sin no more. You, you don't make mistakes. Now, let's, let's be realistic. We're all going to sin until the day we die. But <clears throat> if we're a Christian and we are a Christian a long time, those sins are fewer and farther between. The sins of stumping your toe and getting angry don't happen when you're really close to Christ. That makes sense? The, the sin of getting angry over garbage doesn't happen when you're really living the life for Christ. But when you're a new Christian, a young Christian, everything gets under your skin. That's the difference in the two beliefs, I believe. But, but it's, it's a maturity process. Uh, 
right attitude and the pursuit of godliness. And what's this verse say? This verse, it's chapter, or verse 15, it says that you're blameless. What's blameless mean? Innocence? Can't be criticized because of sin or evil in your life. That's what we're working for. Above reproach. That same verse. Innocent, pure, not living in sin. A person that really follows Christ and lives for Christ becomes that person that is above reproach. I know some of those guys. I hope to be one of those guys sometimes, but sometimes I still get mad. In the midst of a crooked and reverse generation, do we live in a crooked world? Do we live in a perverse generation? Do we so all that stuff? And what that passage is saying is, is we are blameless and innocent. We're above reproach with all the garbage that's going on around us. That we are still trying to maintain our Christian walk with all the garbage that goes on in our around us. God's path is straight and narrow. And we don't stray, hopefully, from that path that's twisted, that has obstacles. Satan would like nothing more than to, well, the preacher that resigned. Satan's having heyday this morning. The fact that it's going to be talked about, the fact that nobody really knows what's going on, so all these rumors will explode, everything will happen, and, and, and the church will be in a recovery mode. I can remember when uh, we were at First Baptist Church Cookville and the pastor resigned. It was ugly. And it was ugly for the next six months, year. But the bad thing was is it was ugly before that. But then it magnified. Verse 16 says, In this world, holding fast in vain. You didn't run. You didn't run away. You held, you held true in the world. That's what God's called us to do, that we're supposed to not run from, from things. What you become... In it, not of it. What do you? We're in the world, but we're not of the world. That's what the Bible says. The next one says, "Be a Christian, Christ-like. Appear as light." When everything else is going on around us, we're supposed to be the light of the world. We're supposed to appear as light. In darkness. I think that's actually what that verse says. That appear as light. Let your light shine. Uh, you must have character in darkness. Ephesians 5 8. For you were formerly in darkness, but now you are in light. And the Lord walk as children of light. We're supposed to walk in light. Let your light shine before men in such a way that they may see your good works and glorify, glorify the Father in heaven. Are we exemplifying the light of Jesus? If we're bah humbug people all the time, if we walk around with chips on our shoulder, if we get angry over the smallest thing, are we really exemplifying Christ? Think about it. Verse 16 says, Hold on, my child. Hold, and that's my, my title. It says, 
holding fast to the word of life. I thought about the song, Hold on my child, joy comes in the morning. You know, that song's talking about tribulation. The things that we have to go through, but if we hold on, joy comes in the morning. Holding out an offering that others may see and want it. If you got joy, uh, I always tell people you're supposed to always be ready to give an answer for the hope that's within you. If you got joy, people want to know what that joy is. If things go wrong and you still got joy, people want to know how you can still have joy. You know, I, I really... I guess sometimes I, I don't mean to be ugly, but sometimes I just get upset that people that are always in turmoil, people that are always having problems, they've got their priorities wrong. You get your priorities right, joy comes in the morning. Holding on my child <clears throat> is holding out, I already said, holding out an offering that others may see, um, or holding on, holding on to the gospel, which leads to salvation. If you're really holding on, if you're really living that life for Christ, people are going to ask you a question. What's the reason for your joy? Why don't you ever... Why, why do you... Why, 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 why? They'll ask you. Do you have people ask you? The last part of that says, holding on to the day of Christ. The day of Christ is our reward, glorification of the believers, not the judgment. Next part says, I will... I'll hold on. I'll do what I'm supposed to do. I'm confident of that glory. I did not run in vain is that part of that verse. And I put that one, it will be worth it all. It will be worth it all when I see Jesus. Life trials will seem so small when I see His face. One glimpse of His dear face, all sorrows will erase. So bravely run the race that we see Christ. It will be worth it all. Nor toil in vain. Our efforts will be worth it all. If we live for Christ, one day we'll wake up in glory and He'll say, Well done, thy good and faithful servant. You've been faithful over few things, I'll make you ruler over many. We're supposed to be faithful. The last part of that, ver that chapter, or that break in the chapter, says rejoice. We have so much to rejoice for. And the Bible says, in that verse, it says, I urge you to rejoice in the same way. In other words, this is the life I'm living. This is the life that I am trying to exemplify. And I have joy. And if you live the life that the Bible teaches, you will have joy. That's what God wants us to have, is joy. How do you get joy? Besides what I just said. No acronym, is that what you're called? An old acronym. I learned it when I was a kid. Joy. Jesus first, others second, yourself last. That's what leads to joy. Always putting Jesus first. Always putting somebody else ahead of you. Sometimes it's hard. 
especially when we live in a world with a bunch of idiots. I mean, I'm being honest. But we're still supposed to do it. We're still, still supposed to have. We're still supposed to be able to rejoice. And rejoicing is putting Jesus first. Let's pray. God, thank you for this message. Father, help us all to draw closer to you. Help us to live the life that's pleasing to you. Father, I'm so thankful for this group of people. They are joyous. They are examples. They are leaders. Father, help this to encourage us to just step it up. Be closer. It's in your son's name. Amen. And we're going to stand and sing, You are my all in all.